again, welcome everyone. I think we're gonna start it now, it's five past the hour. Uh, those of you who are joining, please remain on mute, but feel free to unblock your video if so move to do so. Thank you again for joining us today's conversation. It's a town hall, people power, developing systems, leaders to advance health equity. And a big thanks to Heather Anderson and the Global Health Core team. And Heather, the Global Health Core CEO. I also wanna thank her, Brittany and Fazia and, and orchestrating and planning this, this event along with my colleague at the School Foundation, Norma Rodriguez. Well, there's been lots of talk for health equity and system change especially in the past year and a half since the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic. The role of leadership in making health equity and system change realities has not, has not been widely discussed. Today, we're gonna to dive into that conversation. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Jimmy Briggs. I'm a principal of the School Foundation, leading its racial justice strategy. The foundation is based in Palo Alto, California, but I live here in New York City. I've been with school for the past year and a half, just before the outset of the pandemic. Global Health Corps, the 2018 School Awardee. So we're especially excited to be partnering with Global Health Corps in this collaboration. My own career has been one of, at the, at, at the intersection of storytelling, native change, and activism. I've spent most of my professional life as a journalist. So this conversation in particular, along with the colleagues taking part in, are especially resonant for me and of great interest. I think stories and narratives, how they shift, how they impact our understanding of systems, of equity, of connectedness, are of the utmost important now, especially in the midst of a wave of misinformation and disinformation campaigns. The pandemic has touched every facet of society, regardless of one's status in life economically or geographic location in the world. As we are slowly beginning to emerge from it, all of us, everyone in the world, we're trying to make meaning of the bigger picture, the collective narrative that we all share. We are shaping the story of what happened, the story of what's, what's happening now, and the story ahead of us. Leadership is a key part of all of these stories, specifically the cost of poor leadership in the past and the urgent critical need now for a different kind of leadership going forward in particular. So much of what we do as thought leaders, as partners, in some cases funders, all of this matters. In global health, many narratives are long overdue for overhaul or for reframing. Today, we'll focus on two in particular. That effective systems leadership is, is a necessity and need. That effective system leadership happens organically. It's time to tell a new narrative, a new story. The leadership is a powerful lever for changing global health. But it must be developed intentionally with sustained investment and opportunities to grow early and often. With that, I'm honored and it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. First, we have Dedo Baron Samaj, Director of Strategy, Africa, at the Siegel Family Foundation. Dedo was a 2011 to 2012 Global Health Corps Fellow in Burundi. Then we have Anne-Marie Bruyer, Senior Advisor on COVID at USAID. Anne-Marie, like Dedo, was a Health Fellow 2011 to 2012 in Uganda. Then we have Angel Choa, Managing Director of Zambia and Kumera Pharmacies, at M Pharma. Angel was a 2014 to 2015 Global Health Corps Fellow in Lusaka. Finally, but not least, Ruby Roxon, the co founder and CEO of M Pharma, based out of Ghana. Ruby founded M Pharma, which is also a school awardee to improve access to medicines in Sub Saharan Africa. I'll start the conversation with a lightning round of questions for each of our speakers on leadership development and opportunities in the health equity space. I invite all in attendance to share reflections and share questions in the chat so they can be percolated into the conversation as well. My first question is for the Global Health Corps alumni. Each of you joined Global Health Corps fellows and have stayed engaged as alumni. We know that most leadership opportunities are for senior level executives. What did it mean to you to, to each have access to training and mentorship and be a part of a cohort of other health equity leaders early in your career? I'll start with Anne-Marie. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think the amazing thing about Global Health Corps was the combination of having an opportunity to take on a new challenge with an organization that otherwise might not have hired somebody with my background. I was coming from the finance sector into global health. Um, and I think 
the the aspect of global health core that was really unique was that it was comp that opportunity was complemented with um, training opportunities with the network uh, of leaders and um, I think throughout my career since being a global health core fellow in 2011 2012 I've really reached back to that network of African leaders of global health leaders in the US and beyond um, to get insights from them to brainstorm different approaches to think through some of the trickiest challenges that I was taking on in my work. Um, so that was, yeah, Global Health Corps, I'm so grateful to for um, helping launch me in my global health career and um, helping me build a network of both friends and uh, colleagues. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Dedo? Uh, thanks, Jimmy, and happy to be here with everyone. I was thinking about this uh, question earlier and uh, a few things come to my mind, you know, coming from a background in community organizing and events and comms and marketing, uh, Global Health Corps uh, long ago extended this idea of, and the definition of what being a leader means in inviting people who have really diverse skills that uh, initially in my part of the world were considered to be experts and leaders in the sector to really think more broadly around how to solve health uh, issues and equities in inviting people who have different skill set to also contribute. Um, and the best part of that whole experience up to now, similar to what uh, Anne-Marie was saying, is leaving the fellowship not only with your experience, but the experience of your entire cohort, which are people that you still reach out to for advice, uh, for to create, and uh, the depth of the relationships built through the fellowships are lifelong and they come handy in a variety of forms, personally and professionally. We have seen throughout this pandemic how people lean on, on one another, uh, on the people that we were together in the fellowship, that we are also continuing the same sort of fight for uh, health uh, and equity and this idea of self-determination of communities where oftentimes it becomes very lonely, but this community is a community that most of us really rely on oftentimes. Thank you. Thanks so much for that response, Dedo. Um, Angel, I, I know you've had some audio challenges, but are you with us? Yeah, I had oh, uh, yes. quite an adventure, but here <laughs> I'm here now. But um, yeah, I think uh, Dedo's last point is going to be a great segue into, I think, my experience. Um, the community, I think, the the opportunities for collaboration with the community of uh, my, my cohort at the time, the alums and even the team at, at GHC and the wider community was always, I think, a great uh, draw for me to the program. I joined pretty young and um, I would say I was like a ball of passion and determination. And I think um, having that one year um, around like amazing um, very um, influential and inspiring people, as well as like training and um, opportunities to collaborate really uh, helped channel a lot of that passion and determination um, and catapulted me, I'd say, in my career. Um, and yeah, here I am now. So the rest is history, I guess. I'm so happy to hear your voice, Angel. Sincerely, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your response. Um, I want to bring Gregory into the conversation. Um, and Gregory, I, I want to bring up something that, that we discussed previously in preparation for this conversation. Um, I mean, this, this pandemic, um, you know, to be sure, it's, it's, it's impacted all of us throughout the world uh, universally, but, you know, but not an equitable. I mean, the impact is, it's, you know, we've all been affected, but not equitably. And, and, you know, some of the challenges have been uh, more easily named than others. But one thing you, you said to me, which, which is to stay with me, I've been reflecting on it since then, is also the opportunity of this moment. And I was hoping, hoping Rick, you could share some of your insight um, as, as the you know, co-founder of Media and Pharma uh, in particular, what are the opportunities that you're seeing in this, in this moment with so much attention, um, ostensibly so much funding um, and media coverage of the pandemic? Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I've always been of the opinion that I said, don't let any uh, 
crisis go to waste. And, and you know, I think we tend to be very short term minded in, in moments of crisis where it's about just fix what we can fix today and then let tomorrow uh, bring what it can bring. What we saw um, um, uh, with the pandemic, um, and I remember, you know, it was, it was in February, I was in, I was in, in Nairobi uh, having dinner with a friend and you know, we were seeing Italy about to shut down. And I was like, I'm a generally a paranoid person. So I was just telling my friends, like, I just feel something that bad is really going to happen. And I was like, oh, this is Africa. You know, we have no cases. We're fine. You know, the sun is very, it's amazing. It's going to kill you know, the virus. So we're not going to have any cases over here. Um, so immediately we started looking at the testing gap, right? Because fundamentally, if Europe and the US were struggling um, to test, I said, we are going to be we're going to be screwed, you know, so apologies for my word, if, 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 if we had the same number of cases over here. But the thing that, you know, that struck me was that whilst we could start by thinking about COVID testing, I was like, actually, let's look at more of the foundational infrastructure problem. The problem that we saw was that, yes, we may have a COVID testing problem, but the actual fundamental problem was the lack of a molecular diagnostic infrastructure. Right, that enabled us to do other tests. Forget even COVID, right? Your HIV viral load testing, your hepatitis viral load testing, your HPV DNA tests. Like we were not doing all these tests, right? So whilst all our mindsets was around COVID testing, we said, actually, no, if we are gonna make these investments to build the capacity to test for COVID, then we should not think about COVID testing as the main driver of building this infrastructure. We should actually ask ourselves, if we build this infrastructure today, what else can we use this infrastructure for? So right from day one, whilst we were investing in creating this infrastructure, we were not thinking about just COVID testing. I think it is that type of opportunity that I think that the crisis sort of drove, the pandemic drove, because yes, while you could mobilize resources to build infrastructure for testing for COVID, we said, no, actually, this is a catalyst to get the funding to do that. But we need to use this opportunity to ensure that at the end of the pandemic, any woman that wants to get an HPV DNA test can walk into any of these laboratories and still get tested for HPV, simply because this infrastructure was built in a moment of crisis but it is going to be the legacy of that crisis. Thanks for elevating that, Gregory, um, such an important point. Um, and and Marie, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you have such a rich background um, both in the public and private sector. I'm just curious, you know, from your know, perspective, and I'll ask the others this as well. Um, what are the, I would say, for lack of a better phrase, what are the deficits um, in leadership that you're seeing this moment? But also, what are the shifts that you're seeing that are really intriguing to you? Yeah, um, as I think about leadership development and how organizations really develop their own leaders, I think there's sort of two ways that happens. One is through giving talented people the chance to take risks, to fail, to learn and grow, um, and to ultimately hopefully succeed and to build something new um, and to take risks beyond what they've done before, beyond their initial capabilities. And then the second is to give people the training, coaching, mentoring that they need to be able to build the skills and knowledge um, to succeed when they get those kinds of opportunities to take risks. Um, and as I think about the best organizations in both the public and private sectors, there are organizations that do both of these things really well. And they're really motivated by a growth mindset. So saying we need to empower talented young people, talented people in general um, to take on these risks because that's the only way that we're gonna grow. Um, and so in organizations that, you know, that do that really well, I think that growth mindset and that risk tolerance are really great motivators. In some organizations, there is more of a risk aversion. There can be a fear of you know, empowering this young person. What if they fail? Um, is that going to get me in trouble with my funder or the auditor or whoever it is that, that we report to? Um, and so I think shifting that mindset to say, we need to be able to take some risks on both young people and on other things in general, because that's the only way that we're going to grow our impact 
and that we're going to expand um, our reach and and what we can really do. Um, so I think I've seen I think there's a clear um, need that's been identified in um, both the, the public sector, the nonprofit sector, and the private sector. Um, but some organizations are really doing much better than others in terms of taking action on both that empowerment side of the, the equation and that preparation side of the equation. So I think that's, you know, that's one of many reasons I think organizations like Global Health Corps are so valuable because they do pair that opportunity and, and training to give people um, the chance to grow and learn. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. I'm going to close up that same question to Deno. Deno, I feel like you, man, I, I love talking to you the last time you have such an interesting perspective because, I mean, you, you really have traversed community organizing, activism, working in the field to philanthropy like I am now. I'm just curious, you know, how, what are your reflections around uh, this question, but also to what Anne-Marie just said? Um. Thanks, Jamie, for the question. I think, you know, we have experienced what happens when we extend the definition of leadership, of who is considered leaders. And we have seen through the pandemic how people who are really close to the uh, problems have been able to come up with solutions pretty quickly that respond to the needs of those who are going to suffer and then be able to propose uh, what a centralized solution could look like. We've seen people not only thinking about responding, but how they're going to respond. But when you think about leadership and when you think about how you know, the sector, uh, be it philanthropy or people responding, oftentimes that layer is missing of the people who are really connected to the community that they're serving as being part of the solution, being invited on the tables where they can propose solutions because they understand the magnitude of the problems that they're solving. They have the relationships, they have the trust to actually make the change pretty quickly. Similar to uh, Global Health Corps, how do we bring in decision making? How do we expand our tables where decisions are made to include people who historically are not looked into? Oftentimes the tables are very uh, narrow and uses this tunnel vision on how decisions are made, because oftentimes with people making the decisions are not the people who are going to live with the consequences of the decision that they're making. So with this, it's really important to sort of look at this on a timeline. What are the lessons that we have learned throughout the HIV pandemic and during the Ebola pandemic? Who are the people who really live throughout this to develop expertise and know what to do in moments of adversity? It's people who have proximate relationships uh, with their communities but who oftentimes don't get uh, to respond. Um, and we have seen this in our work. We have seen you know, people who are really thinking about how to work with community health workers and doing contact tracing, but also in the congesting healthcare uh, facilities or people who are trying to figure out ways to provide food packages to the people who are going to suffer during the pandemic. Also thinking about logistics, you know, with the border closing, how do you make sure that supply chain of food is continued and when we know that food can be a weapon. And all these are solutions that can come from a centralized decision-making spaces. And where we have seen in the past that when we wait for centralized uh, solutions, it either comes too late and too little, but where we have seen now how combining these sort of responses at the proximity uh, and community grassroots level, but also centralized level works, but always, always starting um, with uh, the people who live with the consequences of the decisions that they're making. You know, they're not living. They spend their life in the communities where they are at. They have uh, acquired a lot of expertise over time that oftentimes is not looked into as expertise. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, international workers spend, you know, a year or two uh, and leaving the institutional knowledge and the trust and the relationships are not always there, which is the reason why we can't, uh, insist enough on why, 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 including people who have proximate relationships and expertise in leadership is also very important. Well said, well said, Dado. Thank you so much, brother. Um, I, I want to bring in, bring in Angel to the conversation. Actually, you know, I want to, you know, make this as iterative as possible. Somebody, somebody said that it really struck me um, about, you know, the lessons learned or not, uh, from the, from AIDS, from Ebola to this point now. Um, Gregory and 
Angel, but first, Angel, I'd love for you to talk about or give provide your, your perspective on, you know, because I think it really was called the core of narrative and story that we're focusing on uh, around, um, you know, leadership and, and public media and health systems. Um, I'm curious how, how, for your perspectives, how is, how has, if it has been, the historical knowledge or understanding from AIDS to Ebola to this moment has been held or not? And, and why, 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 why have, why haven't, um, you know, I would say less proximate actors um, been able to, to heed these lessons. So um, I think in my opinion, what's needed is kind of like a critical value realignment. I think when from the perspectives of leadership, the people who um, have power need to constantly um, pretty, um, seriously and uh, introspectively think about like what values they hold dear and what values drive um, the decisions that they make, the, um, the, the, the ideas that they believe or like the interventions that they believe are important or more prioritized over others. Um, the decisions around funding are all based on certain values. Um, and like Dejo said, if we don't have the people who are proximate, we don't have the people who are actually involved in um, or who are experiencing the 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 consequences of, of certain decisions on those like at those tables it's really important to be able it's really impossible sorry to be able to um, adequately define values in a way that they truly have the most impact um, both uh, with GHC and with M pharma I think I have I have really had an opportunity to think through um, to think through the whys, right? Like why are we doing what we do? And understanding, and like once that is extremely clear, and like once that's very concise, working with the people who um, implement the work, right? Uh, to understand how, how the best way to get to this, this uh, shared vision or shared goal that we have. Um, and I think for, for me, like in my experience, that has been the most impactful. And when we talk about AIDS, when we talk about Ebola, um, the lessons that we've learned from that, um, why we are not seeing uh, that kind of impact or the positive impact in as we as we uh, tackle other pandemics, um, I'd say it's it's value realignment and like not having that very clear. But I will add that um, when we think about uh, the Ebola response. I think when you look at the countries that um, that had uh, that had been impacted by Ebola, and we look at how their response to the COVID pandemic had been, I think we see that there was already an understanding that that community mobilizers, for example, community health workers, are the most impactful, and so we see that like programs and um, uh, program implementation and even interventions included those people even for COVID. Um, and I think especially in the case of Zambia that those lessons, um, because of how uh, close we were to the Ebola outbreak in, in uh, Congo DR, um, I think they definitely benefited how our system responded to COVID. Um, so I think we are getting there, um, uh, but we just need to continue to realign our values as consistently as possible. What about you, Gregory? Yeah, well, I think, you know, maybe I'll, I, might, I might be a bit controversial uh, by saying this, but, you know, in general, I think one thing the pandemic has taught me is that we tend to confuse equality and equity. Um, and, 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 and most often in my conversations, um, you know, I, it felt that I was hitting my head on the wall because for a very long time, I think we've taken away a sense of ownership. We think that we are giving people ownership and the people that we think we're giving them ownership believe that they have ownership. But actually what I see most often happen is that it becomes a power grab um, opportunity. And unfortunately, uh, we have not used crisis upon crisis to build resilience um, in our system. So a good example, I was in an interview once and um, I was asked, so 
like what prevented any African government from you no know, ordering you no know, vaccines from any manufacturer? Why do we have to wait after a year when countries ordered vaccines for us to sit back and shout about vaccine equity? Like nothing prevented any African leader. I mean, it was an open market. In fact, manufacturers were going door to door asking countries, do you want to order vaccine? You could have ordered 100,000, 50,000. You could have done so. But we've created this culture where we know it's like it's a, it's a script, right? So we know what would happen, right? And, and we saw that happen with testing and we saw that happen in vaccine. It's like a script. We know what will start. We will blame rich countries for hoarding something and we'll open up our arms begging them to give. And constantly this script plays out. It plays out, it plays out in every single crisis. It was the same playbook with HIV AIDS, same thing that happened with Ebola, same thing that happened with testing, with, uh, with the pandemic, same thing that's happened with the vaccines, and the same thing will happen again with the next pandemic. No. Because, African leaders, because African leaders have yeah, been, and yeah. sorry, African leaders have been spoon fed and we have not actually transitioned this ownership because the reality is that most often if we do that there's also this power transfer so do we want to lose the power centers from geneva new york washington dc to accra do you want to create a new generation of leaders in ghana who will take ownership which will not be driven by government officials who get you know fat per diems by just attending meetings so there has to be a complete rethink and unfortunately, I do not think that we're going to see that happen because there are so many people with vested interest in keeping the status quo um, that I do not actually think that we're going to see any change with this pandemic uh, because it requires people giving up power and people do not want to give up power. I love to hear your response to what you're saying. I was just gonna agree with what Gregory is saying. There's a recent report that says, you know, hear this, only 0.07% of all humanitarian funding for COVID went to proximate leaders. Now, what he's saying is really, really, really critical that we need to we take a step back and really think what that means in terms of coming up with solutions that are going to be sustainable. That I think that'll be a frozen. Okay. We'll move on to the next question when Dedo comes back. As soon as the connection should come back, we'll, we'll queue, queue up space for him to fully respond. Um, I did want to want to go. Um, there's, there's a question in the chat, Amory, uh, from Jim, about uh, which I'll read. It's in the chat, so we've all read. I'll, 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 I'll be the first few lines that you can finish and respond if you, if you don't mind. Um, Jim asked, um, how ESG criteria focused on companies like his can help GHG community. Um, and he said a few areas, Cola, we can help in new methods of region, food growing, health incentives, supply chain, et cetera. Um, and then any other areas that are high impact with community leaders, question mark. Could you, could you respond? Yeah, happy to. Um, so I think not knowing more about um, Jim's organization, but I think some of the things that um, that organizations like that and that funders can do are in, and speaking as someone who, uh, who works for USAID, I'm trying, we try to channel this in our work to the greatest extent we can, um, but really focus on impact and focus on growth. Um, so thinking about how do we more effectively measure impact across a range of um, dynamics in a way that it is not require an RCT for every um, different intervention you're doing, but is really looking at um, how many people are you reaching and what's the impact on the people you're reaching? And then how are we pushing organizations to grow? Because I think when organizations are really focused on um, how do we expand our impact and how do we, how do we grow and how do we make sure that um, we're using funding as effectively as possible, over time that helps to empower um, organizations to invest in leadership, to take risks. Um, and then I think it also can help, can really help to push this shift towards more proximate leaders. 
um, because we know that um, focusing on impact and focusing on growth it brings you to um, things that are closer to the community. So I think there's a lot of different pieces and I would love to understand more what, um, about Jim's organization to be able to reflect on that deeper. Um, but I think some of the, those are some of the pieces. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, appreciate your, your, your full response uh, to Jim's question. Um, I think Beto is back. So then I want to uh, pass the mic back to you. We, we lost you, I think, mid-sentence in your, what I'm sure promised to be an engaging response. Uh, I want to create the space for you to, uh, to fully provide your, your answer. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. I was only saying that our inability to drive more resource and power to approximate leaders, like the statistic that I was just giving, uh, at you know 0.07 percent is what goes to approximate leaders who are going to respond affects the ability for us to collect the impact that we're looking for. It means there is so much uh, that they could do, but we being underinvested in uh, really challenges their ability to uh, save lives and to uh, come up with solutions that uh, are more contextual. Uh, whereas we see a lot of waste in the in the sector because of not. Uh, really leaving this idea of inclusion um, of uh, people who can help us think more broadly around what response could look like to make them more efficient and more sustainable. Thank you so much for that, brother. Appreciate that. Beto. Um, I, I want to ask a question for, for, for all, all of you, actually. Um, but I'll, I'll pose, pose it first to Angel, um, and then if anyone wants to respond, the speakers can do so. Um, it seems to me, and, and, and you know, global health systems is, is to be sure, admittedly, it's not my specialty. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm a jur journalist because I'm a journalist. Um, and I'm curious from your respective uh, viewpoints, what, what, do you, what do you think are the, the non-pandemic factors that are even allowing us to have a conversation like this? It seems to me talking about equity and health equity and I'm so glad you framed it. You really were very clear um, and finding the distinction between equity and equality, um, not only in this conversation, but in the larger um, dialogue around health systems transformation and strengthening. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I guess maybe because, you know, maybe because of my own bias, you know, being American, being Black American in the United States, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, you know what impact, if any, a movement like Black Lives Matter, for example, has had, and I'm uh, thinking or being able to have a conversation like this um, among among uh, leaders and, and, and change makers and thought leaders such as yourselves, but also being able to engage, um, and I would say an authentic dialogue um, with the philanthropic and donor community. Um, has Black Lives Matter, have other conditions, um, you know, been a factor in your experiences to having sort of a real talk conversation such as this one? And I'd like to ask that to Angel first. Um, yes, I think as a, I think as as a community, as as a global community, I think we're we're all approaching um, a a place of I guess like co collective like consciousness or awareness um, around like issues that have plagued uh, many many parts of like our society or like many uh, groups in our society. Um, maybe in ways that have not been, or in ways that have not been, um, that have been predominant in certain spaces. So we're talking about Black Lives Matter, we're talking about me, the Me Too movement, we're talking about just generally questions around equi equity and equality. And I think being in a space where the, for, for all intents and purposes, the world was brought to its knees by COVID, I think gave, uh, provided like a pretty strong catalyst to really rethink um, rethink a lot of the issues that we had been experiencing. So there was COVID brought a lot of questions around um, um, the value that we place on different, uh, on, on different people in our organization, whether we are thinking about who are um, who are our most valued or like most effective workers in certain companies versus um, who are the, the critical teams, right? And before this would be potentially like senior executives. Whereas when we looked at what we needed in COVID, we needed the nurses, we needed the doctors, we needed the teachers. 
we needed the community leaders. And um, when we think about that even further, in, in particular in communities that have been disenfranchised or haven't been considered in the past, we recognize that if those communities did not have the best access to the services, if they didn't have the best information, then it would have made it difficult for the whole to be safe, right? Looking from the outside in uh, at the US, for example, um, with, with COVID, there was no, there was no way that, um, is it called, it's redlining, that like redlining, for example, would have benefited um, certain, um, certain districts against others. Everyone was plagued by COVID. And so the idea that uh, someone's socioeconomic status, someone's race, someone's gender, um, or someone's sexual orientation made them superior to another, I think very clearly in the last year uh, showed us that like all those things don't matter, right? And so I think this was a really good, um, it was, a, it was an opportunity, it's been an opportunity for the global community to kind of look itself in the mirror and recognize um, where, where the problems are and like why those problems not being solved or not being considered uh, significantly affect everyone else. So no one's an island, right? And so I think that year clearly showed, last year clearly showed us that. Thank you so much, Angel. Um, Gregory and Marie, you know, did you want to answer that answer as well? Or I can, if not, we can move on to the, to the next. Um, move on, move on to another. There, there's a few dynamics that I've observed over the last year that I think are really interesting um, in terms of thinking about how. Um, how the world responds to COVID and how we engage across countries. I think um, as we're seeing now, the US is at the point where basically anyone who wants to get vaccinated can get vaccinated. And meanwhile, um, in India, there are 300,000 new cases of COVID per day. Um, and so we're at this pivotal inflection point where the US and the global response need to be thinking about how do we really support the rest of the world as effectively as possible um, to respond to COVID and how do we increase the equity between um, in, in the response, acknowledging that we are so very far from that in terms of how the world has responded to COVID to date. Um, I think that uh, I think that this, this moment is one that um, is, is so important. And it's important both from, you know, the world is not safe from COVID until everyone is safe from COVID, um, until everyone is vaccinated, because um, the more the virus is spreading, the more there's risk of um, variants developing and, and, you know, the more it contributes to uh, loss of life, to social unrest, to economic weakness, um, and so, so as we think about that, we need to be thinking about how does, how do donor countries, wealthy countries really engage um, countries that are struggling more and don't have the resources to respond um, to the, the virus, but, but to do so in a way that puts the, those countries in the decision-making place and is not um, I think too, you know, as we've talked about too often, there are donors who are um, who are really setting the agenda and who are defining what um, what needs to happen. But we need to see more and more um, the countries that are most effective taking that leadership role and, and to see those proximate leaders empowered to respond. Um, so those are just a few reflections. I think that the dynamic between donor countries and recipient countries. Um, in COVID has changed in some ways because you can't travel easily between places and some of those connections are weakened. At the same time, sometimes having everyone on video <laughs> makes for a more equal dynamic versus um, when, you know, when people are gathering at conferences and, um, and certain countries are underrepresented. That's great, Henry. Thank you so much for, for, that, for that detail um, and, and, and uh, framing. Um, I want to ask a question of, of, of you, um, as well as the other, other, other speakers. Um, 
I think initially, um, maybe maybe like Gregory, Angel, and then for you, and Henry, um, I want to talk about leadership development. Um, and and you know, Gregory, I'll ask of you more pointedly first. Um, I mean, you have a particular perspective, you know, as the leader in pharma, and you know, you've been a visionary and you know, founded other nascent transformative initiatives, not only on the housing continent, but other places as well. Um, what do you see as the role of leadership development programs, um, like like the one that Global Health Court offers, and in pharma as well, which really are, are dedicated to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in global health? Um, you know, I, you know I, I'll, also, I'll also ask, ask it this way, I mean, for those who've been left out of decision-making um, spaces, um, why is, is leadership development investment important in decolonizing global health? Thank, you, you can go first uh, and you can Thank you, Gregory. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say actually M Pharma has been a beneficiary of, uh, you know, programs like Global Health Call. I mean, I, I met Angel uh, through the Global Health, the Global Health, I, obviously I was not a Global Health uh, uh, Fellow, but some of our first employees at M Pharma came from the Global Health Call, right? Because when you, when I, when I, you know, went to Zambia um, to, to start uh, to start M Pharma, the first community I found myself in was a global health uh, core community, and 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 so some of our first employees came from that. Um, and 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 actually, as an organization, we've hosted uh, uh, you know global health uh, core fellows uh, throughout uh, throughout the year, and, and some of them have actually become permanent employees um, uh, at M Pharma once they, they graduate. So. We are uh, living to the, the importance uh, of, of the programs. I think that at the end of the day, what fundamentally transforms organizations like M Pharma is the caliber of people that we bring in. Um, and more so is this sort of transition from, okay, this is a donor driven world to, we need to build sustainability um, in health systems. Because that's the key. At some point, we need the 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 the, the they call the donor tap uh, gets closed, and we need to start you know fighting for ourselves, and we need to start ensuring that you know it is about ensuring that when that tap is closed, we can still sustain the gains that we have created. And so I think bringing people, what we've seen has worked for M Pharma is, you know, we, we get people, you know, who come with a passion. You know, I say we like to have missionaries, no, no mercenaries. So the people with the passion who believe that we have such a dysfunctional healthcare infrastructure, but also are passionate about fixing that dysfunction. Um, and I think it is by living through those issues, uh, by working in those communities, people come from GHC and they say, you know what, we're working in this uh, community, this organization was donor driven, we're going to join M Pharma, we're going to build a sustainable solution through M Pharma to solve this problem. And I think that has been the sort of caliber of training that the people we've been able to bring in, and, and Angel is a, is a, is a testimony um, of that, that, that training, you know, I think you know, M Pharma, uh, Angel, you know, left GHC and just jumped right straight into to, to M Pharma and today she runs you know, pretty much the largest pharmacy chain um, um, in, 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 in Zambia, Rwanda, Malawi, and building a, a, a more sustainable access to primary care um, in Eastern and Southern Africa. So I think the more we can create leaders who have lived through that experiences um, and whose passion has been sort of uh, uh, created because they've seen what it means to be at the at the mercy of donors um, and not try to, not being able to move the needle because a donor asked you to write a hundred page report or gave you this money and said you could only use it for this particular issue. They come to M Pharma and they say no. We have to look look at new models that sort of decouples um, um, this donor uh, driven um, mindset um, from sustainability in in in, in creating re resilient health systems. I think you're on mute, Jamie. Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Um, 
because Angela is very notes. I mean, you, you joined in from, uh, I believe, in 2015 after your Global Health Board Fellowship uh, with the Population Council. Um, you know, are you, can, you, can you share with us any lessons you learned about the importance of leadership training uh, in your journey thus far? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's very clear um, from from uh, Greg's explanation that one of the things that we find that is very important for us at Mpharma is um, the people that we work with. Um, that, that that's like the the most important I think cog in the in the in the machine, and so ensuring that. I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that empowering people first with information and then with the resources to be able to uh, co co create right to co create the the result that they're looking for so. Um, i'm as a leader i'm very particular about ensuring that people um, understand so. Again, I'm going to go back like what's the value, what are we driving what's our why and why is this so important which, like Greg said, um, we have a lot of young people who clearly understand what the problem is in their communities and um, have probably lived through some of the, the issues that we, we read reports about. Um, and having th this passion, having this understanding, being met with um, a resource that trusts that because they've experienced this, they have a unique um, they have a unique view for how this problem should be solved and like they have a unique they have a unique drive to ensure that it gets um, that it gets done and so i think that's like one of the most powerful components um, of, of leadership training or leadership development identifying that um, the people who who experience what they experience um, identifying those people and providing them with the right kind of resources. So be it training like Global Health Corps, uh, be it uh, trust, right? Uh, like Anne-Marie had mentioned, trust, um, trusting them to be able to, or providing them to take risks, right? Trust to take risks and to, to learn from those experiences and also to allow them to kind of think through problems, to work through problems on their own and like understand, um, from what gets something from point A to B. And um, when, I, when I look at my career from Global Health Corps um, um, up to where I am today, I think one of the, that has been one of the strongest um, components of, of my leadership journey and also my career journey, just like trust and resources. Thank you so much, Angela, for that insight. Um, again, I want to remind um, those in the audience um, at any time, uh, please share your reflections and questions. We have about six minutes, maybe, uh, before we have to wind down our conversation. That should definitely feel longer. Um, I, I want to uh, percolate a question uh, asked in the chat by Pamela. Um, and this is, this is for any of the speakers who are moved to, to respond to it. Uh, Pamela asked in the chat, what takes precedence at the intersection of national sovereignty, equity, and rhetoric about mandatory vaccination? Not a softball question there. Uh, you know, any of the speakers, please feel free to respond. I'm happy to take a stab. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I think it's an impossible question. Um, I think you look at countries like India, which is the largest manufacturer of vaccines, um, but also has the largest COVID outbreak in the world right now. And they have halted export of um, vaccines. Um, and they are the primary uh, source of vaccines for middle income and low income countries through the COVAX mechanism. Um, and so, you know, it's really hard to see a country decide to um, not share their resources. But at the same time, you know, in the US, we've also prioritized vaccinating our own population over, um, priority, over vaccinating the rest of the world. Um, but I think, I think it's important, we have to do both. Um, and countries, of course, country governments are going to prioritize their own populations. Um, but we also are, are part of a global community. And, um, as long as COVID exists anywhere, it exists everywhere. And so really investing um, in, in this global response and coordinated global response is gonna be really critical. 
Um, I think in terms of mandatory vaccination, I think um, the goal is to have everyone globally have access to the vaccine who wants to have access to the vaccine. And of course, to overcome um, misunderstandings about vaccination, et cetera, um, to encourage uptake. But um, I think there's no, you know, there shouldn't be a, a, a desire to force people to get vaccinated who are not comfortable getting vaccinated. Over. Thank you so much for that, Emory. Um, Stephen has, has, has asked a question in the chat, which I think is, is highly pertinent to our conversation and maybe a good way of winding down our time together. Um, Stephen asked, is leadership training the mold of, global health, of the Global Health Work Fellowship scalable? And if yes, how, how would one imagine this happening? Um, ditto, if you can respond to that, I think we'd appreciate your insight. Uh, I was responding on the, on the chatter. Uh, pushing back a little bit around this idea of scale, I know where it's coming from, but I wonder if a scale is the only metric of success. Uh, I don't have an answer to Steve, unfortunately, but I want to just invite us to think about value in terms that are way broad. Um, and we have seen how recently things that have value not, are contextual. Uh, if you're looking at the mission of Global Health Corps is to find leaders who have diverse skill set and put them together and hope that they can create magic. I see elements of it that are scalable around leadership development that can solve other issues that, that are also applicable around education uh, or uh, applicable around different sectors. Uh, but I, um, I, I try to look at the value beyond the, 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 the idea of scale to see um, uh, in what ways programs like Global Health Core are attempting to do something that has not been uh, done before when you're putting people together from different backgrounds and give them some sort of training and send them into the world with some sort of so follow-up support that is going to allow them to solve issues regardless of the sectors that they're going to uh, work in. I don't think uh, Anne-Marie, when we finished Global Health Course, she knew she was going to be working at, uh, uh, at USAID. Uh, I did not know uh, from a community organizing that I was an event planner that today I'll be uh, uh, working for one of the most influential foundations in Africa today. I think that you know, the idea of scale is, is really important, but should not be the only metric around how we think about value. Thank you so much for that response, Ditto. Uh, definitely, I think you get some love in the chat, some plus ones and affirmation in the chat to what your remarks. Uh, so your, your insight is appreciated. Um, we're, we're in the final moments of our time together now. Again, I want to first um, thank um, Heather Anderson, uh, the CEO of Global Health Corps, for inviting me to, to, to be a part of this session, be really an observer, bystander, and, and uh, Ditto, Anne Marie, Angel, and Greg, um, your, your insight, your wisdom, uh, in the case of Anne Marie, Ditto, and Angel, um, as Global Health Corps al alumni, um, what, you've, what you've been able to do um, in your professional journey since then, I just think speaks to uh, the rigor and value of a leadership program such as the one that Global Health Corps offers. Um, I just, you know, respectfully wish you all the best of luck in, in your work and you're having impact already. Um, I think want to thank the audience for joining us, staying with us, for, for sharing your reflections and thoughts. Um, a lot was covered here, a lot hopefully to digest and could wait on after this conversation. Um, and, 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 just, and just frankly, just directly, um, you know, as, as a partner, as a, you know, representing the School Foundation as a, and as a partner of Global Health Corps, um, hope those who are able to do so um, um, in this conversation invest in Global Health Corps. Um, you know, as we recover from COVID-19, as we recover from the consequential um, economic um, crisis that kind of has, has, uh, has created, and prepare for future health crisis in the future. I mean, I think Greg so well, you know, identify, um, you know, this recurring, this, this simple, recurring narrative, this, this cycle, this, this simple narrative, um, and a lack of change, but also the opportunity we have to elevate um, authentic, credible health leadership uh, in, in, in the health systems community. Um, if you want to learn more about how you can get involved with Global Health Corps, you can reach out directly to, to Heather, the organization CEO, 
at heather at ghcorp.com or just I'm sorry, .org. That's Heather Anderson, Heather at ghcorp.org. More to learn about the program, you can connect with Ruth Achilla, Achilla, who is the Director of Fellowships for Global Health Corps. And that's Ruth at ghcorp.org. Thank you all for joining us. Again, this conversation was recorded and will be shared for all who registered. Um, best of luck to you, uh, Greg, Angel, and Marie and Dedo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Well, it was a pleasure sharing this space with you all. Same. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, JC.